the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. The idea that culture wants to define what an appropriate conversation is or who adds value to that conversation on the basis of intersectionality or some other absurd criteria, it pisses me off. But what colleges and universities caved to a long time ago is going mainstream. And I'm going to protest that. If you're limiting your inputs, I think that ultimately has a devastating impact on your outputs. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You know, last week we talked about skiing in powder. And, you know, it's, it was beautiful. It was warm uh, compared to what you did this week, which, you know, is the contrast to running something hot. You were running cold. How cold was it in Montana? Uh, they started at negative 17 and warmed up to negative nine. <laughs> it, it gave me the sense of being in Germany with negative interest rates. Like you you, you think, where do you go from here? Well, and cold, see, we're colder, coldest. We're sitting in the studio and it, you used to have a nose. I know. <laughs> it, now it's black and part of it is. <laughs> fallen off. So, uh, but, you know, given temperature changes and some of the things that are going on, I, I looked at what's going on in Texas right now, Dave. And this morning we were on a call, a man in Dallas, and he said, you know what's happened? A neighbor of mine, he's got a, a swimming pool, a heated swimming pool. Heated swimming pool. And it's iced over like an ice rink. So things are not running hot in Texas either. No. Well, and we'll get back to running hot in just a minute. You know, speaking of that, because we've been talking about inflation and the inflation numbers, you know, we've for years looked at it and said, well, how do you really calculate inflation? We were talking about hot dogs last week and chocolate, you know, things that affect our lives. But when CPI comes out, a lot of times it doesn't tell the whole story. I mean, look at the rents, the delinquencies in rents affecting uh, the CPI number right now. Well, and as you consider the world, you have the developed and developing, if you want to put it in those terms, and the developing world, most of their money is spent on housing and right. food. So, you know, Reuters pointed out this last week that um, through a mix of currency depreciation, rising commodity prices, and then coronavirus disruptions, food inflation soared 14% last year in Latin America's largest economy. And they said that was the largest increase in two decades, with the headline figure masking the, the, the hikes in the big staples, 76% jump in rice and a doubling in soy oil prices. So, I mean, again, for us, it's not as big a deal because maybe in the developed world, we spend a little less as a total percentage of our income on housing and food. But Bill King pointed out that due to mortgage delinquencies and moratoriums, even the part of CPI here in the United States, which factors in rents, uh, in fact, it's about a 40% contribution to the core CPI calculation. Very understated this last time. What he pointed out is there's a 3% discrepancy between effective rents and asking rents, which depresses the rents calculation in the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI calculation. This is because of delinquencies, right? Right now, the rents are not caught back up, the COVID year, whatever it is. That's right. So when renters become current, effective rents as a part of CPI calculations will rise significantly enough to push the inflation here in the United States, that figure, push that measure higher. And again, otherwise, the rents portion, which is almost 40% of the core CPI, was unchanged from, from last week's uh, report. No surprise, energy, commodities, transportation, oh, these were all up. Well, not to mention that, but I mean, you were talking about rent. Properties everywhere are skyrocketing as far as real estate. So we can get into that, but the commodities aren't the only thing rising. It's where you live. Yeah. Bloomberg pointed out on February 8th that the global markets from the U.S., uh, and European bonds to stocks and oil are sending a clear signal. And they say inflation is finally coming back. And, and you, know, you look at the different parts of that. Oil's rallied back and is now posting a 23% gain for the year. Copper, as we discussed on last week's quarterly investor call. You call it Dr. Copper. Yeah, right? that's exactly yeah. right. And, and Dr. Copper is speaking with some authority. It, not only does it give us an indication of economic activity, but also implied increase in costs. Natural gas, I guess with colder weather, no surprise, but higher by 15% year to date. Gasoline, 20%. Corn, 11%. 
And if you're looking at sort of back to transportation inputs, Maersk is one of the shipping container companies, shipping companies that brings those huge 40 foot long containers all from all over the world. Right. Shipping costs have spiked there because number one, you've got a surge in demand for products. And number two, you've got companies who are playing catch up. They're needing to restock. And so there is a little bit of a pig in the python in terms of supplies coming from manufacturing sources and getting over here. So a big bump. And like we said last week, it's not necessarily the actual price that we're worried about. It's the expectation of future price rises. That ends up being a huge part. So you've got the 10-year treasury break even, which keeps marching higher as well, 2.22 on its way higher this week. And again, that's about anticipated inflation. As you say, that's the key. Expectations. And we mentioned rent, property prices, just looking at single family homes, they've now exceeded the previous peak, moving up 14.9% in the fourth quarter to $315,000 for the median price family home. And, you know, prices surged the most on record. And of course, you have low rates, which are part of that equation. Low interest rates are both a symptom of our credit maladies, but equally a cause of what I think is pain ahead. You've got lots of people who are getting into houses that are going to be underwater. You get a minor uptick in rates, and all of a sudden the equation in terms of home value changes pretty quickly. Rates rise. And in fact, when you look at what the dynamics are that move rates higher, rates tend to rise higher on a faster pace more easily then they fall. So we were talking about running cold when you're running at 17 below, uh, you know, in Montana. <laughs> but uh, Bloomberg's talking about uh, Biden economics is just it's counting on running at hot economics. So what does that mean, Dave? Yeah. Run at hot economics. I mean, we had last year's CARES Act, which was the biggest federal injection of cash ever. We've got the one point nine trillion dollar proposal pending now which would be number two on the cash injection scale list. And we covered this last week where, you know, Larry Summers and Olivier Blanchard are, they're concerned. They're concerned, but we talked about that last week. But also you've got this $2 trillion proposal for clean energy, a $1.5 trillion spending plan for manufacturing and childcare. You're just printing money. You're just, you're creating dollars out of thin air. Or at least credit out of thin air and obligations out of thin air. And this kind of spending in the context of already rising commodity prices is a big deal. It's a big deal if you're interested in hard assets. Now, that's if you're interested in hard assets and want to see some benefit from exposure there. But it's also a big deal for very different reasons if you're sitting on a large bond portfolio. Mm. Big deal, not because there's an opportunity, except if you're getting out of the way of, of a potential catastrophe. But it's a big deal because holding on to the belief that the world's central banks are going to forever have your back is going to come at a high price. Mm -hmm. Yes, they've been buying down the rates. And certainly they can reverse course. Certainly we could have a tightening of monetary policy and we could have the bond market throw its taper tantrum 2.0. That's always a potential reality. Maybe we have the stars in alignment for that kind of a move this year next. But before that happens, before a policy shift to tighten, we're already beginning to see the market shift. That is already in play. Well, we can't really count on them tightening right now. Powell's already said he's not going to tighten, but tightening can occur naturally when interest rates start to rise. That tightens the economy, too. That's right. And Treasury rates are on the move. And that's a natural form of tightening, even as the Federal Reserve continues to buy up $120 $120 billion, um, not evenly split. Actually, the most of that is in treasuries with a smaller bit in mortgage-backed securities. That's $120 billion a month. And in spite of the $120 billion in artificial purchases, we're still seeing interest rates in the treasury market move because apparently that's not enough. Yeah, but what's so strange? Okay, interest rates on treasuries are rising. It's not enough. But junk bonds... The interest rates on junk bonds are falling at the same time. What in the world does that mean? Right. So the 10-year treasury is at one and a quarter percent and rising as we speak. At the opposite end of the risk and credit spectrum, junk bonds are posting all-time highs last week. That's highs in price with the yield slipping below 4% for the first time ever, right? So treasuries Hmm. are moving lower in price and higher yield at the opposite end of the spectrum 
is getting some real play. You, you have to ruminate on that. Have to ruminate on that. $855 billion of junk paper, according to Bloomberg, under 4% in yields. And actually, municipal bonds are following in the same direction. You're talking about all-time highs in terms of municipal bonds, all-time lows in terms of yields, yielding less than they ever have before. But they're standing on the bridge of the Federal Reserve. In other words, okay, so the risk on environment right now is being fueled by the faith that everyone seems to have in the Federal Reserve just continuing to be able to keep rates low. So the question I would have for someone who's sitting on a large municipal bond portfolio is this. You've just received, in terms of capital gains over the last 24 months, probably the equivalent of five years worth of income. Why would you leave that on the table? <laughs> I mean, there's this old adage we seem to forget when we're at market highs because nobody wants to take money off the table, but you buy low and you sell high. Okay, so explain what you're saying because I, I you, you caught me off guard a little bit. Well, on we're that. talking, Are you talking about, about the bond? principal increase in the municipal bonds. That's right. As yeah. yields drop, the principal value, you have capital gains take within the that money portfolio. and run is what you're saying. Take the money and run. Yeah. Take the money and run. All right. But the risk on environment, why would you take the money and run? What if they keep falling? And that's the point is you've got yield the chasing. You've got the commitment by yeah. a variety of central banks around the world. And that yield chasing and risk on market dynamic, it continues unabated, even as treasury market dynamics are signaling a shift in inflation concerns. And frankly, junk bond owners should be terrified. But these are not normal days, are they? And these are not seasoned investors either. Well, perhaps that's not so, because perhaps the investment community has just marinated so long at the lower bound of interest rates that they've forgotten what it means for interest rates to be mean reverting, for there to be duration risk, which increases, and credit quality, which is not a static thing. It can change. They've forgotten that the quote-unquote all-powerful Fed is in most respects like the all-powerful Wizard of Oz. Right. Do, you, do you remember that scene oh, in yeah, The Wizard the of Oz where <laughs> all of a yeah. sudden the credibility Pay no attention is gone. to the man behind the curtain. I know. Right. Credibility is gone because the illusion is no longer there and power gets stripped when the illusion dissipates, right? So investor faith in the all-powerful Federal Reserve, again, quote-unquote all-powerful Federal Reserve, that kind of flourishes with no doubts or uncertainties but what happens to that faith when market pricing changes and sort of hits you upside the head with a two by four? You know, it's so appropriate. I was reading this morning uh, about the story in the Bible of the man who built his house on a rock versus the man who built his house on the sand. Now, the, the house that went into the sand or onto the sand really probably went up very quickly. Uh, I would imagine it was pretty impressive because it's like, my gosh, how 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 can he build so quickly? But of course, when the storm comes, which one survives? I mean, that's the parable. And with what we're seeing right now, when you have junk bond rates falling, which means you have an enormous appetite for junk bonds, and you have treasury rates rising, the interest rates, they can't buy enough of them. There's something terribly wrong. And again, you've talked about signals of what does the top of a market look like? Is this what the top of a market looks like? Well, one of the major themes for 2020 was the expansion of debt. Not only did we have massive credit expansion in China, but we also had massive credit expansion here in the United States. And I think one of the themes that will define 2021 is who got to play in that mm. and who didn't. Because even as demand for fixed income and higher yield has increased, the Wall Street Journal reported that for the first time in more than a decade, bank lending shrank in 2020. Really? Yeah. And huh. so, you know, what you're seeing is what we've often called shadow lending. You have your private equity guys who can't find enough companies to buy, and so they start issuing debt themselves. Private mm. equity becomes private debt or private credit. And you find all of these ways that financial operators, but not banks, are getting into the lending business and they don't have to comply with the same capital requirements and rules that banks do. So guess what lobby groups are going to pound down the door of the Biden administration? You know the banks are already up in arms about the fact that they're seeing their loan books shrink shrink. And they were talking about all the big banks. I'm sure some small local lenders could could be a, a comparison and contrast there. But your large banks, whether it's B of A, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, 
their bank books, their loan books shrank last year. Hmm. And hmm. so, you know, the other issue is that you've got financial technology companies, which are standing in for old school brick and mortar banking entities. So are we going to see regulation Absolutely. coming into this? Absolutely. Yeah. So as we've talked about regulation into cryptocurrencies, there is regulation coming for fintech. There's regulation coming for private equity and private debt because these are all workarounds for a system that is otherwise fairly well regulated and from a macro prudential standpoint, controlled for the quote unquote safety of the system. So again, 2021 ends up being a response to 2020 and the excesses in the credit markets with banks being left out of the big benefit. You see, that's counterintuitive. You would think with all the money that's been printed and all the money that's been borrowed this year, that banks would have actually enjoyed the right. But you're saying they're being squeezed out by the non-regulated entities. Remember the conversation we had? Okay, we have some of the greatest guests. I love Russell Napier. Okay, he's got a strong Scottish broke, but uh, if you really listen carefully, he has been ahead of the curve over and over. You know, he's the one who wrote Anatomy of the Bear. Do you remember the conversation we had? I think it was about 2011, 2012, when he told us that inflation was not his concern deflation was his concern. In fact, he sort of was shocking. He said, we may see treasury rates fall well below the stated inflation rate. And <laughs> I, I remember that was counterintuitive to me because we had had these huge bailouts. We had quantitative easing, remember one, two, and three. And uh, Russell Napier's like, no, not yet. Not yet. I'm concerned about deflation. It'd be worth finding out what he's thinking about right now, now that we're starting to see inflation. He has an interesting model. And that model is, let's continue to learn, because there's a lot more that we don't know. The Library the of Mistakes. That's right. right. He runs the Library of Mistakes right. in Edinburgh. And you're right. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been back and forth with him in emails uh, here recently. And while he was concerned with deflationary market dynamics for many years, he's migrated to the inflationary camp. And so, you know... I, I want to sort through his arguments. Of course, we have to sort through Scottish accent as well um, on the program in the coming it's weeks. It's worth it. It's worth twice or three times listen to get through the accent to hear the, the and information. Just as a reminder, if you yeah. haven't made a study of his book, The Anatomy of the Bear, right. it's something of a cult classic among investment professionals. Uh, it's not a book just for the shelf. It's a book to be read and reread. It's very valuable reading. The research and time he put into that was absolutely immense. Russell took me to Adam Smith's grave um, off the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, and then we went to dinner and finally to a, a private single malt club. I think it was the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Right there in Edinburgh. Yeah. yeah. That was 2014, so it's yeah. a little fuzzy, um, more because <laughs> of the time frame than from the evening's tastings. Do you remember when you were there also talking to Smithers? I remember the interview because there was a harp in the background. There was yeah. a harp playing the whole time. That's right. We yeah. did the interview in the lobby of the hotel, and there was a someone playing the harp <laughs> okay. in the room where you know, they're drinking tea and whatever. So it was about the time of high tea. You know, you live the life. You live the life right there in Scotland. But okay, speaking of Smithers, Smithers exited the stock market. And if we were talking to him today, he'd say, yeah, I probably exited a little bit early, but I still have my money and the stock market is still overvalued. Now, let me ask Dave, the stock market just seems like it's bubbling over right now. I mean, is there an end? We're hitting record highs on price earnings ratios and margin and all these other types of things. How far can it go? Yeah, Andrew Smithers talked about the Q ratio and Tobin's Q. Tobin's Q yeah. and and as the most reliable and he demonstrates in his book how Tobin's Q is the most reliable valuation metric. He he picks apart every one of them mm. from, you know, price to sales to price to book to price to earnings, all of them are inadequate compared to the Q ratio. It's worth looking at. But I think he would say an early exit is better than a late exit because when valuations shift the other direction, losses accrue very quickly. Hmm. Just like it takes a long time for interest rates to get to low levels. And then when they move higher, they tend to move at the pace of a sprint. They, they don't give you much time to think about it. That's really the market as a whole on the downside. It takes a long time to get to lofty levels, and it doesn't take very much time at all to give a lot of it back, which is why I think he would be, even though he was early in moving to cash, completely content, better and early than a late exit. 
Our friend Bill King has said uh, in the last few days, don't overthink the stock market now. It's a runaway bubble fueled by record Fed credit creation, record non-World War fiscal stimulus, record retail participation, record manipulation, record hucksterism, which I think he's talking about, you know, Portnoy and Musk and Reddit. But he continues, and record regulator insouciance. That is a context, in my opinion, Kevin, where risk is ignored. And frankly, it's a context where, quite understandably, junk bonds are moving higher, not necessarily justifiably, but understandably. And so we can count on we can count on them continuing to just create money out of thin air, because even Powell this last week, he said it really doesn't. The federal budget, don't don't worry about that as far as how much money we print. We're not going to combine the two. It's a little bit like uh, Daddy Warbucks just basically saying, don't worry about it. <laughs> Actually, I'll use a better example. Remember Jurassic Park? John Hammond, you know, he built this beautiful, uh, this beautiful uh, theme park with dinosaurs on it. And he said, spared no expense, spared no expense. That line over and over and over, you can YouTube it. And uh, <laughs> that line occurs over and over. Spared no expense. You well, that's Jurassic what we're doing. Park. I, why do I quote that movie so often? I don't it's know. A, that, it's yeah. a good one. It's a good one. But they spared no expense, and the Fed's not sparing an expense either. Well, speaking of bubbles, yeah. I, I really don't know what they serve at the Economic Club of New York, whether it's coffee or champagne. But I, I think they might have been serving bubbles at the last conversation. Uh, Jerome Powell spoke last week, and you know, the markets toast the idea. They love the idea of patiently accommodative monetary policy. Investors love knowing that Powell is committed to QE continuing until substantial further economic progress is made. And that's a quote, right? It, substantial yeah. further economic progress. We're going to keep printing money until we see some motion. And speculators are giddy, knowing that tightening will not occur until low-income workers enter the recovery. Monetary policy is lopsided in its benefits. We know that. It favors asset owners. It does not favor low income workers. So, you know, thinking that monetary policy and accommodation is somehow going to trickle down to low income workers and that you're going to sort of keep the pedal to the metal until they see some benefit. That could be a very long time indeed. So do speculators like it when they hear Jerome H. Powell talk about these things? I, I'm using age as Havenstein. I'm going to give him that middle name from now on. Uh, um, that could from, be from early Germany, 1920s. <laughs> If you don't know who happens to is, right? And, and so I guess the question is, will we see a natural tightening occur sufficient to throw the brakes on? Because, you know, we already have this idea that we're going to run, run it hot. That's the strategy. We're going to keep on not only with the monetary policy, but with fiscal stimulus as well. And it's OK if we run it hot. And yet we begin to see the bond market say, you can talk about running it hot. But we're not sure we like the consequences. We're going to have to adjust our price some way, somehow, for all things to be equal. He even talked about federal budget issues not really being a factor as to what the Fed does monetarily. Yeah, that's exactly right. Federal budget issues don't factor into the Fed's deliberations. That's interesting if you think about that. You know, we're running deficits. How is that not supposed to impact the credit markets? Right. How, how are massive deficits not supposed to ultimately impact the cost of capital? And I think what Powell has some huge presumptions there. But according to Powell, according to Jerome, now is not the time to worry about federal debt. Of course, you have that sentiment echoed by the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. Well, yeah, of course, now is not the time to worry about it. You only worry about it when it's too late. You know, when you put your seatbelt on, when you get in the car, it's because you don't probably have time when you need it the most to put it on. OK, you just don't have time. And. Doesn't history tell us the same thing with uh, Federal Reserve policy? I used to drive without a seatbelt just because on principle, it was my freedom to do that or not to do that. And if police wanted to give me a ticket for not protecting myself, I was fine with that because it was my right to not wear a seatbelt or to wear one. And it was a conversation with you that changed my mind on that. It has nothing to do with my regard for the law <laughs> or the misapplication of the law, in my opinion. It has everything to do with responsibilities that I have to the staff here at the office and my family. And it's a small, simple thing that I can do to make sure that if there's something that I'm not in control of, right. that I, I still may walk away and be of value to 
my family and to the office. And so I had to reframe that completely. But now I wear a seatbelt. And I'm glad you do. William McChesney Martin of the Fed would have told you also the same type of thing with Federal Reserve. He, he said, remove the punch bowl before the party gets started. And now Jerome is spiking the punch bowl uh, to get the party started. He, he ordered three more. <laughs> yeah, he ordered three more. Well, history suggests that by the time policymakers do care about the debt, it's too late and you have other complications on your hands. So, you know, Powell also had this sort of throwaway observation on inflation, which was that it's much lower now and it's much more stable than it was 30 years ago. And so we don't need to worry about it. Um, and, and listen, I mean, it's kind of obvious for anyone paying attention to trends in globalization and technology trends that there has been a period of disinflation over the last three decades. But as we know, with markets, it's not where you're at that matters. It's where you are going next. Yeah. And Dave, going back to that seatbelt story, I uh, jumped in the car one time during a, a rainstorm and I put my seatbelt on only because I had promised my wife that I would. We, we were recently married. Uh, it was a rainstorm. I was going to go home. It was just a couple of miles away. And uh, I actually had gone about a quarter of a mile before remembering to put it back on. It was this, this is before the days of ringing bells and telling you, you know, <laughs> but I, I just looked over and I was like, OK, I'm going to do it for my wife because we talked about it. And I put it on. And uh, within probably a minute and a half, I had had an accident that would have killed me had I not have put that seatbelt on. So it is good to do something before the fact and not regret it after the fact. Yeah, you know, my colleague, Doug Nolan, I think he sums up the circumstance that we're in now pretty well. And again, it, it, it's kind of a summation of both the fiscal and monetary policy recklessness. He says the policy focus at this point is little more than a desperate monetary inflation to incite higher markets and more borrowing and spending. There's no long-term strategy. How could there be? It's ruinous inflationism. Capitalism has been crippled. The price mechanism sabotaged by central bankers hijacking the cost of capital, hijacking the cost of money. Markets are broken with the entire financial apparatus from the Fed to Wall Street to Washington geared towards imprudent spending and reckless expansion of non-productive debt. And I think that's one of the tragedies, Kevin, is that, you know, when we see this expansion of debt, it's not as if this is R&D for our future. This is down the toilet money. As much as we're thinking about helicopter drops of money, we're not re-engineering our economy for something bigger and better. The 21st century, which will compete and beat, say, our next great superpower competition in the world of economics, that is, that is the Chinese. No, no, no. We're not reinventing ourselves. We're, we're taking money and we're just flushing it. One of the things that we've lamented, and I know that Doug does as well, is the complete loss of price discovery. Price discovery is the accurate price between buyer and seller. And of course, when you have the Fed stepping in, you have no reason. I mean, it's unreasonable, the prices that we're seeing in various things, either low or high. Uh, you know, I, I even think, Dave, just to shift gears a little bit. Uh, it's the same type of thing with news stories. I'll take COVID for an example. I know that that's a hot topic right now with everybody for the last year. But isn't it strange that our COVID fears finally were satisfied on the day the certification of the election of the new president happened? Yet yet now the COVID fear, it doesn't like Florida for some reason. Okay? Right. Well, so there's no satisfaction in Florida. They can't get satisfaction there. But we certainly did on the, the election certification. Well, I think what you're talking about is it's interesting that the COVID numbers began improving the day the election was certified for Biden. Yeah. And, and it, it actually dropped notably on Breathed inauguration. Breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> Biden's in. And now you have, this is according to the Miami Herald, the Biden administration considering domestic travel restrictions. And this, again, it relates to COVID. Florida is the top of the list. Wasn't Florida a red state? Now, that well, couldn't have anything to do with it. It's probably the mutations yeah, that are of concern. Yeah. We don't know for sure. It could have red state retribution written on it. But yeah, you know, I'm curious to see how the vaccines are offered going forward. This is kind of a big deal. There is a broader global conversation about travel and vaccine passports that has interesting social components. Tony Blair is a huge proponent of this across the pond. And there's this conception of social responsibility, yes, which understood in its particulars sets vaccination as a standard for good citizen, bad citizen categorization. And I just what I'm curious to see is 
if something like you recall this from previous commentaries where we've talked about sesame credits and yeah, in China. China measures sort yeah. of if a citizen is doing the right things or the wrong things and you end up having sort of limited social choices in light of whether you're a good person or a bad person. Mm. But are we close to more of a global adoption of sesame credits? Uh, part of what had me thinking about this was reading through a story by Stephen Roach. And it was a very striking contrast with an, uh, another article, actually two or three articles that I read by Minchin Pei. All, all these are guests that we've had on yeah, the commentary, yeah, Steve, some of whom Minchin. are now in conflict with each other. Hmm. Where Minchin Pei is critical of the Chinese approach to the coronavirus. And I'm reading Stephen Roach in his own conversation, conflicted over the heavy-handed but very effective COVID management in China. Again, Minchin Pei would disagree with that. But contrast that with the less effective, in Stephen Roach's view, Trump, Biden, American version of contact tracing, lockdowns, vaccine rollouts. And, you know, the point being, you can do a lot more quickly, as they have in China, when individual liberties are not a consideration. Right. Yeah. Command and control. You can do a lot with command and control. But there and we're are, supposed to have individual liberties in this country. There's long term trade offs to that as yeah. well. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see how the conversation here in the US is engaged with, perhaps how it's curated, you know, over these issues of individual agency and choice and collective obligation. And and frankly, I have a few concerns over how politicized it seems everything is becoming. And how limiting that can be to sort of a thorough explanation and dialogue on facts and science and, and, and ultimately individual choice. Well, and you and I were last night when we were talking uh, over, you know, let's see, I had a Talisker. You had a Lagavulin 16 year, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the Talisker you had purchased for me. It was, it was a distiller's edition. Thank you, Dave. It's beautiful. That was, that was for my birthday. I've been keeping it since then. But uh, yeah, as we talked, we were talking about, are we, could we be moving on false assumption? You know, as an American, I just assume individual liberty. I assume constitutional rights. And yet what I'm seeing right now is there seems to be this overshadowing of that for this larger term, top down social responsibility message. Forget about whether COVID is affected or not. What I'm talking about is an overall philosophy change. Yeah. And there's a component to it that has sort of an, an appeal, an ethical appeal to the greater good. And you, what you should do is what is good for everyone. Right. And that can justify the, the actions. And, you know, studying ethics, there's lots of ways that you can approach ethics. Uh, greater good, that's one model of ethics. Utilitarianism is another model. There's at least a half a dozen or more, uh, at least in sort of the Western approach to Well, and you even taught ethics. me, I mean, Plato approached it from several different ways. And then Aristotle, he basically said, no, there's, there's a balance between the two. And so you, you know, there is, it's an interesting question and we, we don't have to get too philosophical today, but it really, it bothers me. Let, let's go back though, to something that shocked me, Dave. All right. <laughs> let's, because we do talk about money and finance here. And one of the it. assumptions that I've always had is that wall street is just going to stay in New York. Yeah. But speaking of Florida, they're thinking of maybe moving to Florida. <laughs> the corner of Wall and Broad yeah. is geographically located in Manhattan, right? Yeah. Is it, this is where the New York Stock Exchange is. Um, 400 years of trading. Well, you know, yeah. this is my conjecture. But, yeah. you know, speaking of Florida, you've got the New York Stock Exchange chief warning that the exchange will leave New York if a stock transfer tax is imposed. And it's not like they can just scurry across to New Jersey. New Jersey is equally inclined to impose the tax. So instead of the NY or New York Stock Exchange or NJ, New Jersey, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but New Jersey Stock Exchange, could we end up with the PBSE? Uh, everyone else on Wall Street seems to be migrating to Palm Beach. Why not the exchange? <laughs> well, do we even really need an exchange these days with HFT and uh, laser trading, you know, at high speeds? Where the exchange is, does it even matter anymore? Well, it does matter to the high frequency traders who have computers located spatially as close as possible to the exchange. If the exchanges move, we know the high frequency trader computers will too. And that's that raises an interesting point. The SEC is being sued for ruling that everyone, you, me, everyone should have access to the U.S. exchange's high speed data feeds. 
not just the high frequency traders who pay a premium. Oh, you mean so all animals really are created equal? <laughs> not more animals are faster or more equal than others? Well, the exchanges, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and the CBOE, they don't like it. I mean, obviously, they make some money by selling this premium service, right? But the high frequency traders don't like it either. Obviously, that's about losing an edge. And the exchanges are now pursuing legal action. Hmm. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, Wall Street has always been a level playing field, right? I was traveling this weekend, too. I was down in Phoenix, and I like to drive down there sometimes just so that I can have nine hours in the car to think. And I started thinking about something, Dave, that I've thought about many times before, and I don't understand it. And maybe there's a mathematician who's listening who could send us something and just tell us why elections are so amazingly tight. Okay, when you have hundreds of millions of people in a country, why is it that it comes down to tens of thousands as to the 50-50 split as to whether it's going to be Democrat or Republican? I either smell a rat or I don't understand the math, but why is it why is it so close? Well, I mean, this was a fascinating thing from the Washington Post. You know, Jeff Bezos' paper, I thought it was interesting coming from the Washington Post of all papers. Uh, this came out on the 9th of this month, and the discussion was about how narrow the margin of Democratic Party victory was. Republicans came within, according to the article, 90,000 votes of controlling all of Washington, 43,000 votes for president, 32,000 votes for the House, and 14,000 votes for the Senate. That makes no sense. Now, how, I didn't, how does that happen? I didn't fact check the Washington Post. I assume that everything comes from the Washington Post is, is 100% true. Bezos never has had an agenda, and neither is the WAPO. So what I just find fascinating is that that, as a percentage of the American population, 90,000 votes really isn't much at all. And I know if you're a student of the markets, this, this, is, this makes sense. Markets are determined by what happens at the margins. Prices change by just a slight variation, a few more buyers than sellers, a few more sellers than buyers. That little margin defines the price trend. Well, wouldn't that imply then the next election that we're coming into, you know, in a couple of years, if that has that kind of close margin, there's a vulnerability to really the party in power right now. I think there's an interesting vulnerability tied to sort of a social dynamic if that margin is actually so thin. Yes, small margins equal victory. So that's done. We know that. But a 90,000 vote difference, and again, 43,000 for the president, 32,000 for the House, 14,000 for the Senate, if I read that article correctly, that's a pretty limited Democratic Party mandate, right? So how much is at risk in the midterms comes down to what they try to get done in the first couple of years. Because if you didn't win by much, it might be that you frustrate a lot of people and you see landslides move the other direction. Landslides. And it's not such a small margin at the midterms. There is that risk. It'll be interesting to see. You know, we've really looked at over the last few months, uh, you know, with Justin McBrayer and you know, just just the perception management and control of the media. It'll be interesting to see how the marketing teams on both sides, both the Democrats and the Republicans, play this thing out if the margins are that thin. I think what it does suggest is we're not out of the woods yet when it comes to bipartisanship and contentious politics. Depending on how the media and politicians play ball over the next six months, if there's sort of a fair and respectful dialogue, then, you know, I think there's going to be an, an interesting race come midterms. But if there's a lot of disdain and disrespect, the midterms may be nastier than 2016 and 2020 combined. Mm. And I'll be interested to see how frankly, the GOP deals with this, because on the one hand, they've decided they don't like Trump or anything that has to do with Trump. On the other hand, the number of voters that supported Trump in 2020, that is something they have to weigh against, say, the capital chaos in January. And, you know, I, I think as we watch the impeachment hearings over the last uh, week or so, the impeachment outcome may have been the first indication that the GOP does have some base awareness, um, but I, I, th I think they're in a very tough position. Well, I'm going to, you know, just talking about the control of perception. You know, we have to be very careful. You were talking about, you know, individual liberties or we were earlier. Uh, you have to be very careful when you make rules against the other side because they may actually come back and haunt you. You know, you're reading a book right now that you're you're fascinated with. I also know it's making your blood boil. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we talk about that a little? Well, 
I mean, first, regarding the media and policymakers promoting more cancel culture, I think that all attempts to limit voice promote exit. And that's a, a very condensed way of, of looking at Albert Hirschman's classic book, Exit Voice and Loyalty. But again, if, if you attempt to limit voice, you promote protest. In, and protest in, in the political context is usually sorted out at the polls. Right? Well, and so, I wonder if this next election, you know, Trump in many ways was an easy target. OK, by the way he spoke, there were a lot of people who just said, you know, no, no, we're not going to do Trump. But the iteration that comes out next, OK, because if a lot of people are like me. I feel like I'm being muted. I'm feeling like I'm being told that my opinion doesn't matter, so shut up. Well, Trump 2.0, not actually Trump, but a more polished iteration, could emerge if the American middle gets squeezed by whether it's policy vindictiveness or exclusion from the conversation. And that's, again, where I think the way this is handled over the next 6, 12, 18 months, fair and respectful or with disdain and disrespect, it's going to highlight how much of a culture war is past tense or right in front of us mm -hmm. um, is it feels actually like it's it's heating up, not cooling down. And I, I guess a part of that comes from this idea of unity being the stated priority of this administration, while the practical implication, the interpretation of that word unity seems to be more about conformity. Mm -hmm. um, maybe conformity is the actual meaning of, of the democratic usage or reference to unity. Well, we talked about command and control. Okay. Uh, unity under a command and control or a communist type of organization is going to be conformity. Compliance. Uh, compliance at, at all costs. We're so, good if you do what you're told. Okay. So the book that you're reading actually is not written necessarily by conservatives. This no, is written at all. Yeah. And yet they're making the point, wait a second, wait a second. We may be muted. Right. Everyone's worried about the implications of not having a voice. And, and I've mentioned Pluckrose and Lindsay, uh, the co-authors who wrote the book Cynical Theories. And I've, I'm further along in the book and, and rather disturbed by this, the themes that they're getting to. I mean, a part of it is I, I'm familiar with postmodern philosophy. Um, my wife and I met at a speech that she was giving on the influence of postmodern philosophy on contemporary dance. I mean, mm -hmm. these are things that have been of interest to me for decades. But what they're doing is they're basically saying from Foucault and Derrida and Lyotard come the practical outworkings of wokery and social justice warfare, intersectionality and identity politics. And that is moving from just an academic sphere to the mainstream. And I fully recognize this is not a financial or economic theme, but I see the consequences as having a large enough policy impact to stretch into the areas that we are more typically focused on. And that's one of the things over the last 13 years while we've done this commentary, you know, because actually, Dave, this commentary has gone on since you were 12. <laughs> because that's when I met you. All right. And we would get together. I mean, from the time before you were in college, you remember the times we'd get together when you were in college, you'd come back. We'd I remember that great Greek meal that we had on Second Avenue. And we just you taught me about the philosophy, the philosophers and, and things that I didn't know that much about. And yeah, what a beautiful, must, sunny day. But that was my sophomore year. <laughs> it was a good year. It was a good year. You Sophos taught me. Moros, the, the wise fool. Well, but I had nothing to teach. That's what this commentary is. It's just an extension of our conversations we've had since you were young and I was young. And the point is, and you said something last night that I really have been ruminating on. It's a discussion. The guests we have, we don't necessarily always agree with. The books you read and I read, we don't necessarily endorse every opinion of that author. But we said something about the importance of a discussion. Remember when we were talking about that and you said, you know, Kevin, I think if we plant a flag too quickly on a particular opinion and we say, this is my opinion and I'm going to die for it, you end a conversation pretty quickly and you end future learning. You know, there are an awful lot of things to learn from people that we don't necessarily agree with. Right. And I, I think this is where, again, that this cultural trend towards limitation of, of speech um, or defining, codifying what is appropriate speech or allowable speech the limits of free speech are an obvious concern to someone with opinions and a penchant towards sharing analysis on a weekly basis, the mm -hmm. podcast coming into a 14th year. We start with this as a foundational motivation. For me, I want to grow. And in order to do that, I have to learn. 
I have to discover. I have to explore. I have to continue to seek to understand. And the process for us includes an ongoing dialogue that is not contained by hard edges. We're interested in psychology and sociology and politics and political economy as much as we are finance and philosophy. And I'm thinking when I read this book, I think I'd like to have a conversation with these authors to explore the nature of social interaction and where it goes from here, because so much of what we do tied to growth, learning, discovery, exploration, understanding is about this interaction. You really don't learn if you're always going to the place that you already know. I mean, you talked about margins and markets. Margins. Okay. there. You remember when we were fly fishing, we talked about how the fish are at the edges of two flows. That's where you find them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we talked when you started training or when we started training for the triathlon, there's something called the transition period. Well, races are won or lost on the transition. I'm a slow transitioner, <laughs> but, but the truth is on the margins is where you learn and it's a little uncomfortable. And this is why for a listener to the commentary, if you hear somebody on the commentary that you think these guys can't possibly agree with this person, well, good. Good, because maybe we'll learn something. We don't have to walk away friends. Yeah, and, and I'm not particularly friends of Foucault. And, and, you know, you may want to, if we do have these these folks on the on the commentary, uh, brush up on a little Derrida or Lyotard or, 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 or Foucault. They are the foundational thinkers for theories gaining popularity today. Right. And they are defining the contemporary issues related to free speech. And this, you think, well, this is just the media and snobbery and whatever else. No, 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 no. This has been in the making since the 1960s and 70s and has trickled down through the ivory tower to the man on the street. And there's people operating as media producers who have been through their coursework in college, maybe a master's degree, and take these things for granted as sort of the basis of reality. You know, I think, Dave, back when we sit around and talk, even when we're talking on the commentary, how often do we quote past guests? Uh, it's like we've got this community, like there's a group of people in the room with us all the time. And we can tap in and say, well, you remember when Carmen Reinhart said such and such or Napier said such and such? Again, these are not necessarily people that we would agree with on every single issue, but you can tap into that community and you become a bigger person. Yeah. In our conversations, we rehash the lessons learned from guests. And what you said a minute ago is so true. Sometimes we have agreed with them. Sometimes we have not, but we're always learning and respectful. And the ideas flow from a respect for gaps we know exist and must be filled in our own viewpoints, right? So it comes back to presumption. Presume too much about the world and the way it works, and you may arrogantly limit inputs and dialogue that are vital to your success. Now, I'm interested in the broadest and highest level of success in terms of what it means to flourish as a human being, but also look at the arrogant attitude that you can have in terms of assuming you know the way the world works as an asset manager. Right, right. That's a risk we want to eliminate. Remember, we talked about pilots. You know, there's old pilots and there's bold pilots, but there's no <laughs> old, old, bold, bold pilots. pilots, right? You got to be humbled. Right. So, so we presume the world is big. We presume the world is complex. We presume the world is constantly shifting. And so, too, must our analysis and engagement with a variety of sources. Well, so, we brought up Hernando de Soto last night. The mystery of capital. Yeah. We come back to him. We come back to Napier and the Anatomy of the Bear. We, we return to an engaged critique of Keynes from a guy in finance today, Hunter Lewis. We How about to, Carmen Reinhardt? Exactly. Yeah. Harold James, Guilio Galrodi. I, I think to myself, I haven't had a conversation with Guilio Galrodi in three years. Right. I miss his inputs. John Taylor, Charles We brought him Goodhart. up last week. John Taylor was brought up last week, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bookstopper Higgs, Shukri. I mean, these are these are inputs. And frankly, the idea that culture wants to define what an appropriate conversation is or who adds value to that conversation on the basis of intersectionality or some other absurd criteria, it pisses me off. But what colleges and universities caved to a long time ago is going mainstream. And I'm going to protest that because mm -hmm. without the opportunity to grow, without the opportunity to learn and explore and understand, we're in a bad place as a society. And this is where I, if you're limiting your inputs, I think that ultimately has a devastating impact on your outputs.
You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, and you can call us at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. 